Awesome to welcome former Maryland head coach and Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Famer, Gary Williams, to the basketball podcast. Williams is the winningest head basketball coach in Maryland history. During his 22 seasons at the helm, the Terrapins went 461-252, a winning percentage of 64%. His tenure included 14 NCAA tournament bursts, 7 Sweet 16 appearances, back-to-back trips to the Final Four, and the 2002 National Championship. He was inducted into the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame in 2014 and has the basketball court at the Xfinity Center named after him. Coach Williams, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Great to be here. Look forward to talking to some basketball. The honor to have you here, Coach. And uh, I mentioned it just in passing quickly when we set this up that Tobin Anderson, who's now the head coach at Fairleigh Dickinson University, and myself worked your basketball camp, I believe, back in 1996, which dates both of us, Coach. But uh, it was a tremendous experience and uh, grateful for all that you've shared through your years of basketball. Well, I think it's a great game. And, um, you want to grow the game. I think any coach, um, in addition to coaching his team, has some responsibility to help the game. And, you know, the NCAA talks about being coaches being guardians of the game. So I think that's a good term. Well, it's a great term to describe you, too, because one of the other things that stood out to me through my years of development as a coach was that you seem to authentically share what your team actually did at clinics and through, obviously, video and different types of sessions. And you weren't afraid to share what you did. No, I always felt that, um, you know, that, that that was part of your job is to help out, especially younger coaches as I got older, you know, to just share what we did. And you know, it was up to them to use parts of it. And I know coming up in coaching, I had Tom Davis, for example, was my mentor. And, uh, you know, a lot of things that I did over the years were a direct result of what I learned from Tom. And, and so I think that's part of it. That That's why the, the college game is such a great game is, is because of that. And there's a lot of coaches that, that have done that, that thing. Well, I want to dive into a whole bunch of things, but let's start with flex because, again, uh, flex to me is one of those foundation offenses that as a young coach, that the triangle offense, a few other things that I learned that helped empower me as a coach on so many things, just learning the flex and how to apply different concepts. I'm wondering your impression of the flex now as it's used uh, by coaches, not as a whole, but more as parts. Yeah, I I think that's, um, you know, the way things mutate over time is coaches take um, say the flex and, and take part of that and use it for what they believe in. Uh, You know, the flex isn't the Bible of how you should run your offense or anything like that. But I always like the flex because as part of our system, the way we played, we wanted to press, we wanted to run. And so the flex gave us stability. We knew exactly what we were doing in the flex. There was no, well, I thought I should have done this. I should have done that. It's a very rigid offense. And I, I think it's a great offense for like middle school kids, uh, high school kids, because you learn every, every player has to learn every part of the game and flex. We would do post-up drills with our point guards because they'd get inside in the flex and all of a sudden they were the guy posting up on the flex cut. And, and so it taught the game, but it was also kind of fun because you were running offense at the same time. And, you know, as time went by, we got criticized for being an old man's offense, but usually we were in the top 20 in scoring in the country. So, uh, and the other thing was we, we, uh, we wanted to make everybody think that all we ran was the flex. In other words, we had options off the flex. It looked like the flex and we would always run the flex first play of the game to make sure the other team knew the offense and, you know, they they were kind of cocky because they thought they had scouted it and knew, you know, how to take us out of it. But we, we were running like uh, 20 different things um, by the time we got into the mid nineties and the two thousands. Well, I want to get into some of those tweaks and some of those special things out of flex, but let's start with one of the things that I think you're most famous about, which is removing the down screen from the flex to emphasize that duck in that you talked about, but also to remove the down screen so that you didn't settle for jump shots. Is that the main gist of why you removed it? Also, we wanted to get the ball inside. I mean, you run that down screen, you you don't get the ball inside. You you might get an open jump shot and you know, I see teams running it today to get that that three point shot. They they the screen's a little higher, so they get a three point look because the man comes off the screen. 
which is great, you know, if that's the way you want to play. Uh, but, you know, when we were always able to have pretty good inside players at Maryland, so we wanted to take advantage of it. Plus, you know, this is old school, but I, I always believed if we could shoot the most free throws in a game, regardless of the three-point line, we, we'd have a chance to win, that, a pretty good chance to win that game. So any way we could get the ball inside, we, we would try to do. We were an inside-out team, and we'd shoot threes. We had you know, got, you know, great, great three point shooters as we went along. Uh, but at the same time, you can get that three point shot by going inside out. And um, that, so the duck in move instead of the down screen allowed us another option to get the ball inside. Well, in the part that uh, goes with that, then holding those two players on top is that you were always set up for the counter to the overplay. Can you so can you talk about some of the different ways that you countered them denying those top top passes? And any time you, you have three low, you have some room in there uh, behind the front of the defense. If you have a two-guard front, if they tried to overplay that pass, it was very easy to, you know, ball fake the defensive player, then see if we get a back to a cut off of the other guard. And, and then we just replace. And you could always dribble um, the ball over. You didn't have to pass the ball over. If they overplayed, you could dribble at the other guard and he would just replace you, go underneath and replace you. So – there's there's ways to get the offense moving to set up the cut. The, the other thing was coming into the offense a lot of times, if we were just in a 2-3 set, um, if they overplayed that guard, it was very easy to just exchange in the offside and get, you know, a, a big man up there into the guard spot. And that, that was the, the thing that we were fortunate with. We always had big guys that could at least catch and pass. So they, they weren't going to create probably from the perimeter, but they, they could – they knew what to do, and they could be good enough passers to get the ball inside if somebody did get open. Well, and also the ability to be able to drive to the top. If they deny, that means there's space right. to drive, right? Yeah, and, and that's the thing. If, if you look at the flex, a good spacing in a 2-3 flex set, you have driving angles, obviously, from both guards can penetrate the middle, but the wings have that ability to, to penetrate between the guard and the inside player, uh, the post player on the, on the ball side. So if they wanted to overplay, we would really get into that, like dribble penetration. And then we'd get a lot of threes out of that where we'd kick as, as the defense sagged and try to take that away. So there, there, there was um, – the, the great thing about the flex offense is you can teach it – I swear you can teach it to sixth graders. You have just a two-three set, guard-to-guard -guard pass, cutter, screener, rollback. Don't have anything, just get back to the two-three set, run it again. And then all of a sudden you start adding and adding and adding. And that's when it becomes a great offense. But in terms of, you know, having something for a coach that might only, you know, have two hours a week practice time with the team, I think the flex is great. And it's great for younger players, obviously. I agree. It's tremendous. It's a great spacing template and it's a great structure to start. And then as you already alluded to, you can make it less structured as they learn the pattern. Now they can get less structured because they can always get back to the structure, can't they? Sure. I mean, it's it's very easy. And that's why you 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 teach it like when we would and every year we did this at Maryland, we did this the first day of practice. We made sure we're like when we were dumbing the offense that all five guys would play the five different positions just so you get a feel for, you know, when you start exchanging and things like that, you're going to have to play any of those positions. So, and, you know, if we saw a matchup where say we had uh Grievous Vasquez playing the point guard at six, six going against a six foot point guard. Well, Grievous posted up quite a bit uh, in, in those situations because we could get him down into, you know, the cutter screener type action and, you know, we, we had guys good enough that could pass him the ball when he got open. So when you have a score like that, you want to be creative anyway. You don't want him to come at the defense the same way every time. If you can get him coming at the defense from different spots in the court, you know, you certainly have a chance uh, to be successful. Well, that's what stands out to me in watching your teams. And I got a chance, I've got a chance to know Robert Eason really well as well. One of your former coaches who. He's uh, one of the uh, great assistant coaches I was fortunate enough to have. 
he he's a huge fan credits you with so much of his life in basketball and that's awesome to hear uh but talking to him he talked about how much you guys did attack matchups and again that's a reflection of the system being very adaptable and not being this really structured we've got to do it this way you were always finding a way to get your best players opportunities to shoot yeah, the, the, the most structure in the flex was always the last two minutes of the game. If we had like a four-point lead, five-point lead, we just run cutter after cutter. And sooner or later, they'd either foul us because they started worrying about the time running off the clock or we, we would get an inside look. Um, and, and so that was the most structure. But during the course of the game, you know, we were, we were running, um, for instance, on, on the guard-to-guard pass and the, and the cutter going off the, the uh, screener that screener would roll instead of the rollback move, he'd roll all the way up, give the, give the player with the ball a side screen there, and then run the, uh, the original passer, the guard to guard, the guy that started the offense, the guard to guard pass to the corner. So he'd be sitting there on the three point line. And when you had a Saruna Shesakavichis or an Eric Hayes, that was a pretty good look because here comes the driver off. And now do you help off that corner three? And that's, that's the toughest three to cover is that corner three because do you help or don't you help because you, if you help you know it's it's the shortest three there is so um you know it, it, there's a lot of things you do like that once you get a feel for your players and see it, it that that goes into um teams that run offense like golden state's offense a great offense you know you have you have Curry have all, uh, running a really good offense that they know. Curry, Thompson, some of the best shooters in the world, some of the best shooters ever in the game running that offense. Well, I'm a high school coach. I got one guy that can maybe make a three. I'm not going to run that offense. I don't care if it is a great offense. I'm not going to run it. That's not best for us. And you, you see that all the time in college, as well as with guys running an offense that's not suited for their personnel. So you always make adjustments based on your personnel each year. Some years we took a lot of threes, uh, you know, uh, and because we had really good three-point shooters. Other, other times we really had to be careful and make sure we were wide open if we took a three because we just weren't that good at shooters. I'm imagining you'd have a lot of fun in this modern era of players being really multi-positional and a lot of multi-talented players, you know, big players playing on the perimeter, little players playing inside, that you could really manipulate the flex to be able to take advantage of advantages, couldn't you? Yeah, I, I, I really um, look at today's players uh, just in, say, 15 years. They're, they're so much more athletic they've done so much more individual work um you know they're stronger uh at the same time i'm not sure they know how to play the game as well as some of the guys did back in the day because they didn't have that physical ability to do it so they had to rely on execution uh fundamentals of the game things like that and i I think there's a combination there that, that can make for great teams. So I, I think Villanova is a good example of that where they really could dribble penetrate at the end of dribble penetration. They all knew how to post up so that they could score if, if, if that's what they had, or they knew how to kick it to the open three. And, and, and so I think that's what you're looking for, some type of balance, because you see too many teams, when they come out in the court, you know if they have a bad shooting night, they're going to lose. They, they don't have a way to go if the ball doesn't go in from the perimeter, they can't win it with their defense. They don't have pressure defense when they get behind, you know, all, all those things go into uh, having a, a program. And, and, you know, you, you look at the Rick Patino's what he did with pressure defense over the years. Um, you know, Tom, Tom Izzo with his ability uh, to go, go after you defensively, like the, the defense has to be a part of, what you believe in. You you can't just see there. And every, everybody talks about Bayheim, you know, at Syracuse just playing the two three. Well, he played a great two three. I I played against that uh three years when I was in Boston College when they had Pearl Washington and all those guys at, at Syracuse. I mean, th- those guys individually were good defensive players. And he'd always recruit long players, guys like six eight that could, you know, had long arms and and uh it was very difficult uh to operate against. And you know, he really believed in it. And I think that's the other thing that, you know, I've seen over the years, the really good coaches believe in what they do. In other words, I'll go to a clinic and get a play I think can really help what we do, but I'm not going to change 
my philosophy on basketball based on what some guy talks about at the clinic, some coach talks about at the clinic. And I think that's the key is to keep improving what you have, but you can't teach something unless you really believe it. And I always felt our players, they didn't always agree with me. <laughs> that's for sure. But they always knew that I knew what I was trying to tell them. And I think that's one of the things I'm proud of as a coach that when, I, when it came time for practice, that was the most important thing in my life is to do a good job those two hours, two and a half hours. Great advice, Coach. And uh, you you referenced this, so I'm just curious, um, in terms of the flex and in terms of the pressure, which we're going to talk about, they complemented each other really well, and that was intentional. Which one came first for you? Well, I was um, I went to the University of Maryland. I wasn't a very good player, but I played, and I, I got to play against uh, two, two systems that were really good. Um, Duke, a coach named Vic Bubis was the coach there now. Then he, he was a very good coach just back in the 60s. And he would implement full court man pressure. And back then, coaches were reluctant to sub much. You, you played six guys, seven if you got in foul trouble, maybe. And he would come at you with multiple guards. He'd have four guards who were really good. So he just ball went through the net. They were going to be on you. You had to work the ball up court, somehow get it up court. And I know how tired that makes you. And when you get tired, as you know, Chris, you, you start making bad decisions. So that, that was their goal to get you in the second half. And then Dean Smith came along in the ACC with his run and jump back then. He was doing all kinds of pressure defense, much more than he did later on uh, in his career. And I, I just saw how effective that could be. And then I was fortunate enough, um, I was a high school coach in uh, Camden, New Jersey, and to get the assistant coaching job at Lafayette College with Tom Davis, who was a big believer in pressure defense. And that was like, getting your master's in pressure defense uh, coaching with him because he didn't care. He was, he was going to press you and he really believed in, in, in what he did. And, you know, he just, um, he won a lot of games at Lafayette just with lesser talent, but with the idea that uh, a strong belief in, in what the players did. It's great stuff. It's great to go down the memory and find out kind of where this all started for you. And just before we leave the flex, maybe just what were some of your favorite tweaks to the flex to be able to counter some of the defensive things? Let's say, for example, switching. Well, one of the, um, the, the switching thing, um, you know, people thought for, for a while there that that's how you handle the flex, but on, on the two, on the two, three set, um, guard to guard pass when that that uh, cutter goes off the uh, screener if you cut low make sure it's a low cut that way if they they switch in other words the guy playing the screen takes the cutter coming it's very difficult for the other defensive player to keep the rollback move from happening and so we 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 would look at it there so one of the ways teams of switch would do that that they would sag off the guard to try to help with the switching going on in there off, off that little uh, action, that screen action. So we would run the guard to the corner to force them to get out of there or give us an open jump shot from the corner. So that, that, that was a quick one that we did. Uh, the other thing we, we did um, was when um, um, we, we would um, – on the switch, if we could get them in a switch, then we would uh, always look to see if we could get that guy on that next cut quickly, as, as quickly as possible, because we could get that where guard got, got isolated. So we, we would do a thing called hold. We, we used to call it hold, where we, we would just run um, against a switching team. We'd go guard to guard pass. The cutter would go. They would switch, and all of a sudden, you got a smaller man on, on your screener. So we would just reverse the ball quickly back to that the guard that started with the ball, and he dribbled down and get that angle and throw it in there, and we'd have a mismatch on that. And on the other side, we'd stagger just to occupy everybody. And you know, once in a while, we look for that shot coming off the stagger. But basically, we were trying to take the ball over and get it in there. And a player like Lonnie Baxter, or Chris Wilcox. Or, you know, guys like that, um, they certainly knew how to position themselves so that they we could get that angle. And 
you know, when a good big man gets the ball in there, he's going to get fouled or he's going to score. So it, it was a big part of our offense against switching teams. I love that, that hold concept. So essentially you mean that we're not going to screen for that player again. We're going to hold them in the post. Yeah, we, we just hold them back. Back and, yeah. and um, you know, it, but, it, but it takes players. Uh, we were fortunate uh, to have players that could pick up on those things. In, in other words, they were willing to focus and practice enough where, because that gets a little complicated. Um, you know, that that's, that's flex past the, say, the middle school or the high school level. And that, that's what you could do with that offense. And see, I was fortunate to have four-year players a lot, a lot of the time. You know, we had some guys leave early, but basically four-year players. So every year they ran that, they got better. Because we didn't try to change much except add to it. Mm-hmm. So we always had the basis that we were going to do. We're going to do this. First day of practice, we could run the flex if we had guys returning. And – you know, it made it easier to focus on other things. Like, we, you know, we had set plays, we had screen rolls, we, we had things we did that we could spend time on because we knew we could come back to the flex and have that basic thing going for us. And the other thing is when um, uh, you, what, you're, what you're trying to do is you're, you're trying to cause problems for teams preparing against you. So most teams figured out how they were going to cover the two, three set. So we would run like an inverted set, a point guard or five and four outside, two and three on the block and down screen for them to get us into the flex set. And we could do, excuse me, we could do a lot of things off of that inverted set. Um, you know, one, you know, if you have a great point guard, if you have a Steve Francis, if you have a, a greatest fast catch, if you have, you know, people like that, they could really um, score on their own. You don't want to take that away from them. You see, people always look at the flex – is, is saying, well, you're, you're hurting the individual development uh, of players. That's what coaches would use against us in recruiting. And what, what you're doing is you're trying to find ways to take advantage of their individual skills. Like we used to uh, do a thing for Vasquez where we'd be in that inverted set and he'd take it to that right side, which was our five man. Our five man would start down. He'd fake like he was going down the screen. And he'd just peel back into a sideline screen and roll. And we, we were one of the first to use the sideline screen and roll. It would be located just off the uh, foul line, extended toward the sideline. And so what we would do then, we would send the three men on that side off of a stagger. Our, our four and two men were, were setting a stagger on the other side. So we completely clear out that side. And when you have a five man that, that can make like a Taj Holden, for example, was 6'10", he could really shoot. When he was in a game in the 2001 and 2002 teams, we would we would have him set that screen. So as fast as went, if his help man helped it at all, Taj would just step out toward the three point line or the three point line and be a, be a threat to shoot. And of course, if you could get uh, Gravis in a, a switch situation, if you could get him where he had a step on his man, he he was just uh, he he would score. Uh, and so you you do things like that for your personnel. Uh, and you, you try to develop your personnel into uh, players that are, are really good players who happen to run the flex, you know, offense. And the, the championship team in 2002, we had four players playing the NBA off of the starting five. And, uh, you know, you don't get to the NBA without being, a, you know, developing as a basketball player. So we took a lot of pride in that. Yeah, I mean, it definitely wasn't true that the players didn't develop. They developed tremendously within the system. And obviously, we talked about the three cutters, the pin down entry, obviously the flex cut, the duck in, the rollback. One thing I do want to bring out is I I loved when I saw that weak side high guard pass to the duck in, and then you cut the ball side high guard off of it or high player off it, almost like a blind pig action. I'm curious, did that come a little bit from the triangle influence? Yeah, yeah. I I mean, you're always trying to pick up things. Uh, It's funny, when I was in college, we we were a very conservative team. We walked the ball up. But we ran kind of the the Pete Newell reverse action where guard would hit the forward, go to the corner, and then the other guard would come to the top of the circle. And the inside player would, uh, as the ball swung now to the top of the circle and to the offside wing, that, that screener would set that screen and that wing would cut off instead of, you know, a baseline guy cutting off like in the flex. And so I was comfortable with that uh, from, from having 
played in, in that system. And, and so uh, I watched a lot of the Bulls stuff. And, that, and, and, and you know, the, there was a big Pete Newell influence uh, on what that triangle offense, which, you know, the, all, all the Bulls players, uh, you know, they, they complained about it, but all they did was win championships with it, you know. And, yeah. you know, and let's face it, when it got in, when the shot clock got down, there was Jordan or, or Pippen with the ball. They were in pretty good shape in that situation. And, and that's what that did. It, it gave them organization. They, they were probably more organized than, than a lot of the pro teams. But it didn't take away anything from a Jordan, you know, from from the great players they, they had on the team. And so I, I think you, you have to have that that uh, that bedrock that you can go to. In other words, the Bulls were struggling or whatever triangle. Here it comes. You know, it's coming. But they, they executed it so well. And that, and that was that was a, a big part of what we would try to sell the team that I don't care if they knew what was coming. If we executed it well enough, because we'd have so many options to go to, that whatever counter they tried to do to the flex, we had something that we could counter what they tried to do. Absolutely. You had solutions to everything. And uh, it was really fun to watch. And uh, it still is. And you see it a lot, again, in the modern game, just not as maybe a whole. But I'm curious, if you were coaching now in this modern area, era with the emphasis on a little bit more of the three-point line, obviously already referenced free throws and getting it inside, which the value of that is it's still the same. Would you just run it higher and wider or would you keep it more true to what it was in terms of running it a little bit more compact? Well, you, you, you uh, if you watch Bruce Pearl play at uh, Auburn, he runs yep. it a lot wider um, and he, he doesn't run it exclusively. He, he runs it. And he does a good job depending on, you know, his talent, whatever he has, but he also coached with Tom Davis, which is interesting. Um, so, um, yeah, you, you know, I, I coached like 42 years. And so you had to adjust during that time. And so I think, you know, we, we would have done some adjusting uh, for sure. Probably taken nowadays, you know, with the players so strong and you'd probably take more threes because the three point shot now is, is what a 17 footer was 25 years ago. You know, I mean, that's nothing Absolutely, to use. Yeah. You know, high school kids, you watch them come out for practice and, Everybody's on the three-point line bombing threes, you know, like the first shot they take coming into the gym. It's, it's, it's amazing. So we do some of that, but there, there, there are ways to get the threes out, out of the flex. Uh, when we had Juan Dixon, obviously he got a lot of attention from the defense. So we put him um, at that three spot sometimes, even though he was, you know, two for sure. You know, he wasn't really a three. But we'd go guard-to-guard pass, and what he would do, he he really cut hard. But once he got to the screener, he would just peel back and we would throw the skip pass back as the screener turned and screened his man once he got past the screen. And so we we were able to get Juan a lot of threes on that. The other thing we would do with him out of the two three set was put him at the two spot so that the four man, as the ball is being dribbled in, the four would be in the guard spot. He'd go down and set that screen so Juan could read the screener. He was really good at that. So on, on that play, Juan could um, uh, he, he could come out, uh, you know, on a curl move, which he made a living on uh, running that curl move off that down screen. Then he could go if the, if the guy, if the defensive player came up the inside, he'd fade to the corner for the three. OK, or if it was just a good solid screen, he just pop out at that 45 degree angle, which could easily be a three point shot for Juan Dixon. So. I think we could adjust a lot of the things that we did into if we had good three-point shooters getting threes for those guys. But at the same time, we weren't going to run offense just because it's in vogue right now to shoot a lot of threes. You know, I mean, we, we'd have to see what, how it would benefit us. Absolutely. You do. You do a great job, no doubt. And uh, just fun to hear you talk about that and shifting gears a little bit as we get into some of the full court pressure stuff, which was, again, also part of your success uh, you know, the one thing that stands out again is your players played with an edge. They played with the toughness. And one of the quotes that you said is, if you are aggressive, you will continue to get better. So was that just a mentality that you just felt that uh, being aggressive would help your players develop and help your team succeed? Oh, sure. And I, I think the thing that pressure defense does is, especially in practice, uh, you can't hide. You, you might be able to hide playing drop back man-to-man defense. You might be able to hide playing a 2-3 zone or whatever. 
but you you can hide uh, in pressure defense. You're out there. You're kind of isolated uh, on the court. You're playing 94 feet. Now, that's always the big argument from players is you know you're 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 costing. Yeah, you know they all think you're going to play in the pros. You know, once you get to a certain level, and you're 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 wearing me out. You're wearing me down by pressing, which, you know, the great Kevin McHale. When somebody uh, asked him about uh, why he played every game when he was healthy, he said, well, it's basketball. It's not like I'm in a mine, you know, mining for coal. Or I'm playing basketball. I'm playing a game. And you have to remind your players of that sometimes. Uh, and I think they gradually bought into the fact that with a flex, pressure defense is a great way to play because what pressure defense does, it, it puts teams – into tra- you know, forget about stealing the ball and pressure defense. It puts teams in transition, but it's if you're really uh, playing hard with the pressure, they think they're open by the time they shoot. We usually have a guy flying at a guy if he's shooting in transition. And a lot of times that guy is not sure if their coach wants him to shoot that shot. So the doubt's there. Anytime you put doubt into shooters, they're not going to shoot as well. And as the game went on, the legs started to go on the guy because they weren't used to playing full court against full court pressure all the time. So all of a sudden, those same jump shots they might have made in the first half didn't go in in the second half. And, you know, it would we would want to get into transition as much as possible as an offensive team. So anything we could do to make teams shoot quickly, we'd like. So we would basically look to run on every play. And then if we didn't have anything, okay, we get into the flex or, or, or whatever. And that takes really uh, good judgment on part of your players because you can't run a lot and take bad shots. You know, pe- people think because you fast break a lot that you just come down and fire running gun. I think is the term that people like to use. Well, that's not how you play transition. You, you run, you force the defense to really work hard to get back. And then if they make a mistake, you got an easy shot. If they're good, they get back, you run your offense. And it's a pretty easy concept, but it's hard to put into motion because players have to make decisions on the run. And a lot of teams can't do that. They, they can make good decisions out of their half-court offense, but they don't make the same decisions out of transition. Couldn't agree more. And uh, maybe for coaches that didn't get a chance, there's a lot of young coaches watching, give us a brief, quick overview of what the press was for you because it was a little bit multidimensional. It wasn't a one thing. Yeah, we. I always believed that you needed at least two presses. Uh, so we are, are, are probably uh, the one people uh, recognize the most is the one, two, one, one. But then we also had, uh, we'd run it two ways. We'd have a two, two, one, and we'd have a two, one, two. So we were basically showing three presses. And, um, you know, it's 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 amazing. Um, We would always press at the end of practice because instead of running sprints, we would have both teams pressing. And players like that because at least they they, they hated sprints. So at least they, they were playing basketball. You know, we start from a free throw and just go. You know, that, that type of thing. And it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun for me as a coach. But the, the one, two, one, one press is people say, well, you're, you're really gambling because you're up there near the baseline trapping. It's a very safe press because we would only have one trap. That, that was the, the principal rule of that press is one trap. So we would set with the four man on the ball, the two and the three up front. The one would be, we called that the intercept position. One was never involved in a trap. And our five man was our safety. Our one would hesitate a little bit before he really went up hard to allow the five man time to get back as a safety on defense. And so what we were trying to do was we were trying to force the ball into the ball side corner. Um, And, you know, teams that really work hard, the teams we were playing would work hard with pressure sets and things like that. So we had to do a good job of scouting, getting what pressure set they might use and and adjusting our defense. But the basic idea is to get that ball inbounded close to the baseline, as close to the corner as possible, trap with our two and four or our three and four, depending on the side. And then one, look for the interception out of the trap and five, protect us long. And, you know, a lot of really good players, good ball handlers, when they get trapped, they're going to throw the ball to the first open man they think they see. 
And so if you have a good point guard at the intercept position, he picks up on that. He looks into the trap and sees the eyes of the passer, sees where he's looking, and then he goes from there. And it's it's amazing how many times you can get a deflection, how many, you know, you don't get a steal all the time, whatever. But but say they complete the pass out of the trap. We knew that the press was over. There was no second trap. There was no hesitating, should I trap, should I not trap? It was one trap and get back on defense. And that way we could get enough guys back where they didn't shoot layups against us. If they did take shots in transition, we could have a guy flying at them. And all we did was make them work hard to get the ball into the offensive end of the court. And that becomes big in the second half of games. Um, now, you, you had to be careful against who you were playing against. Uh, I always felt if we, if we were um, stronger than the other team, we had a better team. We were going to press right from the opening. I don't, I don't care what they did, whatever. We wanted as many possessions as possible because if I had better players, we should win that game. If we were playing somebody as good at us, um, I, you know, we'd still press, but you had to be a little careful. You, you couldn't go crazy. And then you really had to pick your spots if you're playing, say, against a Duke when they had Leitner, Hurley, Grand Hill, you know, those guys. Or, you know, the, the 2010 team, I guess, that won a national championship. You didn't want to open up the court too much against them because, you know, they were good enough to take advantage of it, obviously. And so, but we'd still press after free throws, sideline situations, things like that. we press, uh, but not as much. Well, I want to get in uh, great insights, by the way. It's really cool to hear all this. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the sideline because I think that's something that, again, coaches should consider a little bit more, don't you think, to be able to get a little bit more aggressive on the yeah, sideline? Yeah, I'll tell you the truth. I couldn't believe that, that more coaches, you know, and this isn't out of any vanity on my part. I just, you know, I, I watch other coaches. And if I see something I think can help us, I'm stealing that, you know, I'm, I, and I'll give the other guy credit. I don't care, but I'm going to use it. And that sideline press, if you, you think about most gyms, they have scores tables, they have team benches, they have course side seats now in a lot, of, a lot of areas where there's not much room in the sideline. So right away, the guy bringing a ball in bounds on the other team is uncomfortable. It's not like baseline where you can back up six feet in most places. So you got that working for you right away. Before the referee gives the ball to that guy, if you if you got a guy up on a ball in pressure on the sideline, he tells that guy, you, you got to give him three feet. You got you to stay back off him. But then the referee gives him the ball, and, you know, we gradually sneak up there where you're pretty close to that sideline guy. And the referee never called that. You know, they, they never called it. So what, what we would do is we, we were looking to get the flexions out of our one two one one press. So if the ball went out of bounds on the sideline, especially in the backcourt, uh, we didn't want the, the other team to feel, well, they've gotten out of being pressured that time. So that's where the sideline pressure came into, into play. So we would just turn the press to the sideline. In other words, if the ball went out of bounds on the two-man sideline, we would just rotate the two to half court. The three would come in on that baseline side, and the four-man would still be on the ball. Our one would still be our interceptor, and the five-man would be our safety. And so most teams had really good pressure sets against full-court pressure. But the sideline, we 90% of the teams we ever played against, the only thing they ever did was have a line. So we practice against that every day, how to, how to handle guys coming off the line, whatever screens. And so we were really good at it. And so they were kind of playing into our hands uh, with, that, with that set. And, you know, if you, get, if you get one or two wins a year just off of, you know, sideline pressure, plus the mental aspect of that where – you know, the ball goes out of bounds. Teams, just, well, you just kind of flip it in and, you know, we'll go down and run our offense. Well, that, that pressure adds up during the game. We always talked about that. If we're tough enough, we can wear down a team. We'll wear them down. It might not show. You might not get any steals, but we're going to try to get the ball. So what we try to do on that sideline is force the ball to the sideline as, as much as possible. Our two and three men had to do a good job with that. And if we could get a quick trap, with, you know, the four and two and four and three right there, we were in pretty good shape to get a look because teams weren't used to playing against that. They, they, they struggled with that once we got a good trap. If um, a, a lot of teams um, started, what they would do on the sideline, if the ball was up toward half court, they'd get in the line and then run the back, the last guy on that line away from the ball. He'd run to the opposite corner and throw long. Well, 
what we that was tough to cover to keep the ball from coming in bounds. What we would do is we would get into as the ball was in the air, we would get into a two-two-one or two-one-two press. So they still had to go against pressure because they were coming from ninety feet. So we had time to set that up if they did throw that safety pass to, to the far corner. So we were going to press whatever happened from that sideline situation. I love it. And I, I do think I agree with you. I think more coaches should consider doing that. And I've had some teams tell me that points per possession drop significantly, even just by going, going zone out of bounds on the sideline. Uh, so teams can't run their man stuff. So it makes sense to be even a little bit more yeah. aggressive. Yeah, I, I think so. And once again, the only thing that cost you is effort. So we would always tell our team, uh, like first day used to be October 15th, but you know, the team's practicing in the summer now, but we would always tell our teams that we were going to be the best conditioned team in the country. And we were going to do it by playing basketball. You know, that kind of got their attention. We're not going to do it by running on a track. We're not going to do it by running sprints at the end of practice. We're going to do it by how we play every day in practice. That's how we're going to be the best conditioned team. And, you know, who knows who the best conditioned team is, but all, all I need is for my guys to believe that they were. And so we really try to sell that. I said, yeah, we're working hard today, but that's because we're going to be the best conditioned team in the country. And they just kind of shake their heads. And they're, they're probably uh, saying some other things to themselves. But, you know, it was OK. You know, it, it was OK because we thought if we could get the game in the last four minutes, we could we could win the game. You know, it was funny. Based on our flex, based on conditioning, um, we felt we, we, we could win that game. And once you get guys believe, yeah, and you know, Coach, uh, just the, the mental aspect uh, can't be overlooked in the game. And I, I worry about that right now. I think some coaches are afraid to uh, put their will into a team because, you know, the NIL and the, the transfer portal and all those things. But, you know, you, you have to get your players on that same wavelength where they think they're going to win that game. It's, it doesn't matter if you're up two, down two, down three, whatever. Last couple minutes of the game, you're going to win it because you execute better. You you are in better condition. You know all those things, and you just hammer that every day. That you know, and then all of a sudden in practice, you make a great play on the press to win a, a situation, and you go see that that's it. We got it now. See, this is how we're going to win games. And, you know, they players players want to win. They, they 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 hate to lose. They, they they can act like it doesn't bother them and all that, but it does. And 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 you know, human beings hate to lose in, in anything, business, whatever. And so you get your team to that level uh, where they – and that's, that, that can be high school, that can be college, doesn't matter where it is. Um, you know, I, I think you look at the great NBA teams. Golden State hates to lose, you know, the, the, the last few years. Uh, teams like that, the, the old Celtics, Bill Russell, hated to lose. That was a big part of their success. But they just hated to lose. I, I love the point. Basketball conditions for basketball, yeah, especially when you're playing full court like you are. Uh, back to the sideline a little bit then. Would you adjust it where sometimes you would trap or you would not trap based on yeah, if, the if, situation? Yeah, if they, yeah, if they inbounded the ball too far away from where it wasn't realistic for the four man to go trap, we'd just get back. We'd, and we'd have a car, our point guard. We, we, we did double fist. We just hold up double fist and everybody get back on defense. I mean, it was... It's easy. It, it, it was not hard. And the more you do it, you, you don't get caught uh, making a big mistake that, that might cost you, you know, a score or, or whatever. But the, the other thing is we would do it in the, um, the team's front court, too, when, when they had the ball out of bounds on the side at their basket. The only thing we'd adjust on that if it was um, um, on the sideline and the two man was closest to the baseline. We would back him up so that um, teams couldn't throw the ball directly from the sideline into the post. We would fr that be a front on the post, basically, is what it was. But the other thing that would do, it would open up that corner. But that's basically where we wanted guys to catch the basketball. So if we backed up on the post and they'd cut a guy off the line into that corner and throw him the ball, sure they complete that pass. But that two man, that's not far. It's like twelve feet to get back out there to press, and it's a quick run for the four man to get down there and trap. And that was some of our best traps out of out of we called it fifty five sideline was to uh, get that ball trapped in that corner in their offense. And you say, well, you're you're gambling because you're playing three on four in an area where you can catch and shoot. 
but it was really hard to get a pass out of that. And most passes would go back toward half court, you know, so it give you time to set up your defense after your pressure. And, and the one thing we always reminded our players, uh, and I think I'd overlook some, we were, we were, that was a one trap press. We, we were not going to go trap again. And that's where I always thought maybe I was too conservative with it, but I always thought that um, if, you just trapped once. There was no gray areas. In other words, coach, you, you know yourself when your player comes to you, well, yeah, but I could have done this and, and you got and that. No, no, this this is, we just trap once. That, that's it. And that way, you know, there's no confusion. You can put a sub that doesn't play many minutes into the game and he'd be fine uh, doing that. He, he wouldn't get screwed up. And that was a big part of it too. When you press, we play eight guys was ideal. If we could play eight, we could really be a good pressing team. And so that eighth man might not get as much time as the other guys. But, you know, offensively, you might lose something. But defensively, you didn't want to drop off. And that eighth man usually was pretty good as a pressure player. We had a guy named Calvin McCall who was ACC uh, Offensive Rookie of the Year in football his freshman year at Maryland, but loved basketball, came out and played on our basketball team. And he was really valuable on the championship team because you could throw him into the game. And he was a competitor. He was an athlete. And. You know, we, we had guys who could score. We, we didn't care. But guys like that are really valuable if you have a pressure type team. I love that. And the fact that you just said remove the gray areas, that's such an important part of pressing. There's no doubt. Uh, another thing, like you talked about the interchangeability, a little bit of the flex offense and the press had some interchangeability as well. But you also were very positionally specific in terms of putting people in the best situation to be successful within the press, weren't you? Yeah, and, and I think... Um, you know, once you start allowing, uh, say, the, the, the one, two, one, one press with the two and three, a lot of times the two man is, as you score, he's on the wrong side. He's not on his side to set up the press. Well, once you say, OK, well, just, you, you know, just let, let the other guy take the, let the three man take your side. And you take now you can't do that because then they start getting lazy in the press. And it's my fault as a coach because I allow that to happen. You just have to be tough enough to say, no, two man's here, three man's here, and that's how we're going to play. And it's it's extra work, but it takes away another gray area where you don't get caught with two guys on the same side and all of a sudden they're down there shooting a layup uh, against you. And, you know, and, and so you have to be that rigid. In other words, the point guard is never allowed to trap even if he's standing next to the ball on the inbounds pass. He's not allowed to trap. That way it takes away – three guys on the trap where you're going to get beat down the other end. Um, and, and just things like that. The other thing with the five man, one of, now that I'm thinking about the uh, press, which I haven't done for a while, that five man, um, people say, what, what if they run two guys long and they throw a baseball pass from out of bounds to either one of those guys? The five man really has to be disciplined in that he stays in the middle. In other words, he can't go and go get that ball coming down the sideline. He's got to stay there as your goal really is, is what he is. And depend on the front of the press, uh, you know, basically your one, two, or three men coming down hard. And if they do pull up and try to take that three, by the time they're shooting, a guy's flying by him where he sees the guy coming defensively and hopefully bothers the shot. Plus your five man is going to get that rebound if he stays in the middle. So, you know, and, you know, it's a little bit of a gamble, but, not much. Um, you know, teams are going to beat you in their half-court offense. Teams run good half-court offense. You're not going to stop them every time anyway if you just play half-court defense. And so, you know, it's nice to rely on your half-court defense, and we did. We had to be good, especially the last couple minutes of the game. You have to be good. But at the same time, that, that doesn't mean um, you stop a team every time. And the worst thing you can do in pressure defense is team does a great job of the pressure set. They get in, and boom, boom, they score. Just to take your press off. Because players look at that as, okay, if, you know, coach, once we, you know, they beat us, we, we won't have to press anymore. Now, you, you can't ever take, we would change presses, but we would never take the press off uh, in that situation. Well, and that's the value of having multiple options out of the press, right? To be able to adjust sure. to that yeah. and to be able to create variability for the opponent. Because any opponent's going to get used to attacking the same thing over and over again. Sure. And what we liked about the, having a reputation as a pressure defensive teams, teams would have to use some of their time that they would use in their offense or whatever to prepare for our press. So it would take away from their practice time 
a little bit about what they wanted to do to attack us. And so I always thought that was an advantage uh, with pressure defense. It just gave the other team another thing to worry about before they played us. Generally, you like to go back to man to man. Yeah, uh, that that was the other myth of pressure defense. I learned that quite, you you can go back to man to man. You just have to do a good job of talking, uh, getting people covered. And uh, we hardly we didn't play much zone anyway. But I, I can't remember specifically wanting to get back to zone uh, out of pressure because they were hurting us because we couldn't get matched up. You can get matched up if you want to. Coach, you referenced uh, positional responsibilities a little bit in terms of getting to their spots in the press. Then when you're recovering in the half court to man to man, did you did you care about cross matchups or did you want them to get to their matchup? No, we we would, um, you know, obviously you want to stop the ball. Yeah, you, you had to stop the ball. So whoever happened to be in that position, but we, we would try to uh, talk our way back into coverage because it's, it's funny, a lot of teams, you know, they, they'd attack the press, they'd come down and you were scrambling to get back. And they didn't have anything. They would t- they they couldn't get into their half court offense right from there. They had to go back toward half court. Once they did that, it was pretty easy to get matched up again. And once again, you you had to be careful. Teams were really good uh, in that situation because that that's why we didn't press say a Duke as much. Or when I was in the Big Ten, you know, in Michigan, um, you know, Glenn Rice <laughs> coming down, you had to be a little careful with guys like that. That. They didn't get open looks. And so, but basically most teams you play against, you you can do it. You have to practice it. It's not easy. To, and you have to get guys, if you have guys not talking out there, you, you get screwed up. You, you get the wrong matchups. But basically we could do it. I love asking pressing coaches, especially Hall of Famers like you. So when you introduce and install the press, are you installing the press before press break? And then within the scope of your practices, what was first? Was it the, the flex or was it the press that you installed first? No, uh, we, we went with the press because um, yeah. uh, we wanted we wanted success from day one with the press because you, I think I said earlier, you have to sell the press. It's not something the players necessarily want to do. Right. So we wouldn't give like the second team that pressure set because <laughs> we wanted to turn it over. You know, and, and, and you know, wanted to succeed with a press right away that first day, and really, a, a one-two, one-one press, high school definitely you can put in the first day of practice, and it's okay. You know, it's it's not bad. You know, because you have there's not a lot of things guys have to do. It's not real technical to, to be honest with you, uh, and so you get you can get a look, and you know, you you just. And I always believe this in the press. Whatever I want to do, like say the flex on offense and pressure defense defensively, I wanted those two to be a part of our season every year, no matter what else we did. And so I was going to put in the basic flex and pressure defense the first day of practice because that would give us the the ultimate number of days to work on that. Uh, You didn't miss any practice days of two things that you really want. And then uh, hopefully you steal a couple games in December because you're good at those two things where other teams have put a lot of things in and they're not quite good. They're going to be good, but they're not quite good yet when you play them in December. They haven't had enough time to work on them. So that that was a big part of uh, both pressure defense and the flex offense. I love the psychology and the thought process that goes into these things. And uh, another thing that uh, I have to ask, I mean, you you had so many – solutions to what other teams were trying to do in terms of breaking your press. So what did you learn about press break that can help us all from having pressed for so long? Um, Most teams are right-handed so that the guy that got the ball out of the net that was going to bring the ball in bounds, he would always like a quarterback, a right-handed quarterback rolling out to his left. He'd rather roll out to his left be an easier throw for him. So we kind of knew where the guy was going. So every once in a while, you can mix it up. Um, teams would uh, try to go. They, the only problem with that, if it is a right-handed player, when he'd run the other way on the baseline, it was a tough throw. He took away part of the court by doing that because he couldn't – the backboard was – the glass was there, and he couldn't have that angle to throw long. Um, I, I think teams that hurt us the most weren't afraid to throw long, to be honest, um, you know, because that, that, that was hard. Um, and it was a gamble on their part because we'd, we'd get some of those passes. But, you know, 
teams would, would throw long would de definitely give us trouble. Teams would try to get it in quick were, were good, too, instead of, like, walking the ball, get it out of the net, walk to your spot where you bring the ball in bounds, out of bounds. You see teams do that. But what that's doing is giving us a chance to really set up the press well. There was no scramble. There was a, we, we were really in good shape. Uh, and then they would run their pressure set. Uh, the one four became uh, very common as a pressure set. They would put four across the foul line. And what they would try to do is run the sideline guy, ball side, up to the baseline, hit that pass, and then the elbow guy on that side would sprint uh, kind of uh, out of there toward half court, and they try to hit him. But, you know, because it became so common, we became good at co covering that. That, that, be, that. that was no problem. It was a team's, you know, and, and they'd get us maybe the first couple of times. We'd figure out what they were trying to do, and we, we could get it back. And, and you know, it's funny. Teams would run their pressure set really well early in the game. So, say we get out of the, the 55, the 1-2-1-1, one, 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 and go 2-1-2, two, two. then we'd come back with a 55, and it would work. You know, they, they, there'd be that slippage, that game slippage uh, that you see once in a while. And, you know, there there's so many things – and I used to tell guys uh, when I did clinics, coaches, I, I tell coaches, I say, look, there's so many things that go into this. Don't don't just look on a piece of paper and draw on a piece of paper and say, well, what happens if this guy does this or what happens if he do this? Well, you can't answer every question. There, there, there's things you can do that work. But, you know, you put the game pressure, you turn the scoreboard on, if you're playing at home, the crowd, all those things go into how good your pressure defense is. And you have to use them in, in whatever way possible. So we would always talk about the, um, you know, like be, before a game, we, you know, big game, we say our crowd's going to be unbelievable tonight. We get that press up. It's going to, you know, be crazy in Coldfield House or Xfinity, you know, whatever. And uh, they, they like that. You know, they, they like the crowd going nuts. And so pressure defense is one way to get the crowd into the game. Believe me, if you want to get your crowd, if things are flat, press the crowd crowd gets into the game. Well, I'm glad you brought that up about the fact that you can't you can't teach it all in a drill. You no. can't tell them every solution. No, because they, you know, if you trap, obviously you're playing three on four. Somebody's open, but to get the ball to the open guy is the key to pressure. Is to take away and e the easiest look possible and the secondary look. We always talk about that all the time. Now that I think about it, the first look got to take that away. The secondary look. You know, you got a pretty good chance to get that. Very few, it's like a quarterback. Very few teams get to that third look where they find the open guy if he can cover those first two looks. And so, you know, that that's that's the gamble with pressure defense. But that's the excitement. That's that's the uh, oh, and the other thing is with pressure defense. If we stole the ball, we weren't setting up our offense. We we're going to score, and the players obviously like that. You know, that was their chance to uh, you know go crazy you know, uh, in transition or whatever. But I, I really believed in that. Uh, you, know, you get a lot of three, you know, you talk about the three-point shot. You get a lot of th uh, three-point plays in that because the, the team would panic because they, they made a mistake. They threw the ball away. Now here comes a guy driving the ball, and all of a sudden they're trying to block a shot. And so you get a three-point play out of it. And the momentum with pressure defense, if you, you know, the, the, the feeling of scoring six points in 20 seconds. Once you do that, your press is going to be good the rest of the year because your players have that have had that experience of feeling that, how that feels, how they change the game. And, you know, you go from there. And I'm imagining the primary way you worked on the press is by playing a lot of five on five and playing a lot of situations uh, out of it. So if you're if you're running half court offense, um, a question you would get at clinics a lot of times is we have trouble getting our press up after we score. The, the coach would ask me, how do you do it? And it's a good question. The, the thing is, every time you score, say your first team is running against the second team, running their, their offense. Every time the first team score, they get into a press. You might blow the whistle right then, or you let them have one pass, trap, blow the whistle, or take it through one time and move to the other end. And so we, we would practice – we, we didn't even think about it, that we were practicing getting into the press. But we were. We, every, every time we'd score in practice, not every, but most of the time, 
we we would never stop. I I I'd kill assistant coaches because every once in a while they blow their whistle and put a ball in the basket, and I'd have to explain to them that's not how the game's played. The game doesn't stop when the ball goes in the basket, and so that's what we do. We we would just get it up, and so you get into a game, and all of a sudden it's easy. You know, you get your press up because that's what you do every day in practice. Such a great point. And uh, coach, I know you you have such a passion for the game, obviously a Hall of Fame career, everything with it. Uh, I'm curious, just from an on the court perspective only, is there anything that you love about the current game, the way it's played or vice versa, something you don't love as much? Yeah, I, I think um, it, it's college basketball. You know, just talking about college now, I, I think it's such a great game because the emotion that's there just about every game. And it doesn't matter where you're playing. You don't have to be in the ACC or the Big Ten to have an emotional game. You you you, you can have two Division three schools that are really playing hard and going after each other. And, you, you know, you, you just see too many NBA games, especially in January and February, where, you know, that emotion is not part of the game. You know, they're, they're kind of going, you know, they're, they're, they're working. You know, in their mind, they're working. They're, they're not having fun playing basketball. And so I, I still enjoy watching any game like that in college where, where teams are really going after it. You know, I, I think the, 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 uh, the great thing about, about the game now, I think there's uh, the, the passing has become, uh, because of the three-point line, you're seeing a lot more skip passes and, uh, you know, as teams sag off the opposite corner and things like that, you're, you're seeing great passes uh, that, that guys have great vision and see. And so I, I like that part of it. Um, what I don't like is a, a, a two man offense, hmm. a ball screen and a, and a guard. The other three guys stand on the three point line. I can't stand that. You know, and a lot of teams do that that shouldn't do it because they don't have good enough shooters on the three point line to do it. I understand running that once in a while, you know, there's nothing wrong, but not as a steady diet, you know? And then uh, the other thing is, um, Coaches having to call timeout to try to get their guys to play hard. You know, that, that's not the deal. You know, that that's not. And I, I used to, you know, and I had to do that once in a while. And, and I, I would just say, you know, all I'd say that there was no X's and O's in that timeout. All I would say is, you guys understand, we just use one of our timeouts because I have to tell you that you're not playing hard enough. And I was trying to embarrass them as much as possible because, you know, they were good guys. They, they weren't doing it intentionally, but they just couldn't get going to start the game. And you, you see that too many times, uh, both at halftime and the start of the game where guys aren't ready to play and it's basketball. You're, you, you know, you're, you're doing, you know, what a million people would love to be doing uh, instead of you. And you have to remind them once in a while. Coach, I can't thank you enough. Just incredible stuff and grateful to be able to, and honored to be able to talk to you. And, uh, you know, coaching has been good to you, hasn't it? It really has. I, I've, I've been so fortunate. I, I coached in a great high school situation in Camden, New Jersey. Then I, I became an assistant to Tom Davis, who taught me so much about the game. And then lucky enough to get a Division One head coaching job as my first job at American U. Uh, from there to Boston College, from there to Ohio State, and then to Maryland. And to be able to coach in the ACC, Big Ten, and Big East, certainly um, I got a chance to coach against all the great coaches. Uh, and so you can compare yourself against those people. And so in my 44 years of coaching, you know, I, 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 you know, had all the highs and lows you can get. And so I'm very satisfied with what I did. I, I admire the young coaches, the time they put into the game now and trying to learn the game. And um, hopefully the college game continues to be a great game. Well, it no doubt will. And uh, thank you for your time and your service and uh, sharing the game with us today. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it.